In this video, I'm going to talk about potential energy and where it comes from. Now, because the mathematics can sometimes confuse the issue, I'm going to work strictly in one dimension at the moment. So we're interested in the force that some agent exerts on some object. And since everything is entirely in one dimension, I can draw some x-axis that connects these uh, two things and the motion, any motion is only along the x-axis and the force that the agent exerts on the object is a function of space and it only ex uh, exists along the x-axis. So everything is purely one-dimensional. These are vectors but we'll just work with the x components of these vectors where the sign then indicates the direction. All right, and so if the um, agent exerts a force on the object and this object then moves some distance uh, delta x from some x initial to some x final, then if there was work then done on the object and the work done is equal to the integral one-dimensional from x initial to x final of f of x dx. And we know from that th this object is a uh, particle and so the work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy of that uh, of that particle. Okay, and so now what we want to uh, assume is that f of x, this force, is only a function of the coordinate. Only a function of x. First, that it is a function of x and that it is only a function of x. We can write it as a function and it is not dependent on say time or the velocity of the particle. And so this is what we mean by a conservative force. Th that uh, a conservative force is uh, first of all that um, it can be described as a function of position and that it's only a function of position. And in one dimension, that's sufficient. There are additional mathematical complications when we uh, go to other uh, three dimensions, but we won't deal with that right now. So the fact that this is a function of position means that this integral has a very uh, simple, um, well, depends on the mathematical form, I suppose, but because it's a function of position, we can apply to it the fundamental theorem of calculus and that uh, we can, the, this, the work then, if, okay, fundamental theorem of calculus says that we can identify an antiderivative of f of x, which we'll call phi, capital phi of x, is antiderivative of f of x and so then the work applying that to the to this integral is just the antiderivative of f of x evaluated at the endpoints uh, x sub i to x sub f which is then just the difference of the antiderivative at the endpoints okay well that's fine and so um, before I go any further, I'm going to, so, so first of all, this is just now a new function, right? The antiderivative is a new function of x. 
Um, before we go any further, I'm going to define yet another function of x, which I call u of x, which is negative of this the antiderivative. And so now my work is equal to uh, negative this new function x final minus u I uh, sorry plus u initial or equal to negative delta uh, u of x the difference of this new function u of x uh, between the endpoints x final and x initial where u of x is simply the negative of the antiderivative of the force I've just applied the fundamental theorem of calculus to the work integral that we've seen before and we can do that under the assumption that the force can be described as a function of position and only as a function of position this new function which is the negative antiderivative is the potential energy function associated with the force f of x associated with the force f of x. So at the moment I've just done that simply because I can. The usefulness of this process only comes up later. So first let's look at some, let's do some practice. Let's say I have some constant force f of x is equal to a some constant force. Well the antiderivative of a is a x plus some constant c and so my potential energy function then would be negative ax plus some constant c. You could say minus c, but this is some arbitrary mathematical constant, so we can say plus or minus c, doesn't matter. Um, so that's straightforward. In fact, that was so easy, let's do another one. If my function is ax squared, then uh, the antiderivative of such a function would be a over 3x cubed plus some constant and so my potential energy function would be negative a over 3x cubed plus some constant. Alright? Fine, so let's apply it to some forces that we know. Okay, so gravity so is gravity a conservative force? Well, can it be written as a function of position? It can. It's if I have um, to establish a coordinate system. Here's zero in the plus x direction. It would be negative m a g, these, these are of course vectors, this would be the x component, would be negative ng, it points towards the center of the earth, which would be in the negative x direction. And so the potential energy function then for that is the negative antiderivative, which would be mgx plus then a constant. All right, and so first of all, did we establish it was a um, uh, conservative force. Yes, it, it's it's constant everywhere. So um, and and it doesn't depend on velocity or time or anything. And so it satisfies our conditions. It's a constant function of position. Okay. So let's look at spring force. Now again, we have to establish a coordinate system. Uh, let's start with sort of the easiest spring example. I have some 0 plus x. This is at the equilibrium. <laughs> S, equilibrium for the spring force. And so this, given this coordinate system, we can represent 
the spring force is a function of f given by minus kx. Again, it's a uh, vector, but this is the x component since it's all along the x direction. And it, the force then points towards equilibrium. Given this coordinate system, the potential energy function associated with this force is the negative antiderivative. So that's 1 half kx squared plus some constant c. Okay, so um, the the important thing. Well, let's let's look at just before we go on. Uh, what about something like the uh, uh, friction force? So if I have some mass that's sliding along the ground, we'll call this the positive x direction. It appears to be constant too. Well, the magnitude is constant. The frictional force then is equal to mu times the normal force. And if it's sliding along the ground, the normal force is equal to the force due to gravity, so uh, mu mg. However, with coefficient of friction, however, the direction of the frictional force depends on the velocity. So it, it opposes the velocity. So in fact, this force is velocity dependent. The direction depends on the velocity. So it does not satisfy our condition as a, uh, as a, um, um, a force that can be represented only as a function of position. This object at this position could have two different frictional forces. If it were going go in the way it's going, then it was frictional force would be in the positive x direction. If you turn it around, if we're going this way, then the frictional force would be in the opposite direction. And so at the same location, it could have two different forces depending on the velocity. Okay, so it does not satisfy our conditions of a conservative force. And so we cannot represent the friction force with a potential energy function. Okay, back to potential energy functions is that the important thing to note is that only differences matter. The work done by, I'll come down here, the work done by the agent on the object is equal to uh, the, the difference in two values of the potential energy function. And so this means that we can choose where we want the zero of potential energy. And so that's a separate choice to our choice of coordinate system. So, for example, if we look at our spring here, and so we get to choose choose the zero of a uh, potential energy, which means we get to choose where the potential energy is equal to zero. So if in a spring, let's choose our potential energy to be zero at x is equal to zero. That's a separate choice. We're saying the, the potential energy at x is equal to zero is equal to zero. That now, this choice is what determines then the arbitrary constant in our potential energy function. So this means u, well, I'm just repeating here, is equal to zero is equal to one half k zero squared plus z. This is zero. So this is saying c is equal to zero. With this choice of of uh, zero of the potential energy, then the potential energy for this spring is one half kx squared. So this may be an equation that's familiar, but you have to remember that the assumptions that go into such a thing. The this uh, representation of the potential energy function of the spring force depends first on the choice of coordinate system where the zero of our coordinate system is at equilibrium. Also our choice of zero of potential energy. We've chosen our potential energy to be zero at the equilibrium position. So for springs in fact um, you're 
almost always going to be most useful to choose the zero of potential energy at the equilibrium. Not always, and we will see an example eventually, but most of the time that's the case. So let's let's look at gravity for a second where we might choose different locations for the, the zero of potential energy. So here's gravity. We'll choose a uh, coordinate system and here's some table at uh, height h and the zero of our coordinate system is here on the floor. So our force is going to be equal to uh, negative mg since our coordinate system is positive up and our potential energy is equal to then mgx plus some constant. So let's first say uh, let's choose our um, potential energy to be zero at x is equal to zero. Well, in this case, then, this is equal to mg zero plus c, which is zero. So this implies c is equal to zero on our potential energy function u of x is equal to uh, mgx. All right, and so this uh, this potential energy function is fine, but it in it assumes that our coordinate system is is here at the floor, and that our choice of zero potential energy is also at the zero of coordinate system. So that doesn't have to be the case. So let's choose a different place. Let's say what we really wanted was our zero of potential energy to be at the height h. So we're saying our potential energy at x is equal to h is equal to zero. So this is our zero of potential energy. So let's plug this into our potential energy function. This is mgh plus c now is equal to zero. So this implies that our constant c is equal to negative mgh. So now our potential energy function is equal to mgx minus mgh or uh, you have mg x minus h. Both of these are perfectly valid potential energy functions because only differences in potential energy have real meaning. And but we they result have different mathematical forms because we have chosen different locations to for the potential energy to be zero. So as you complete these problems you will have to identify not only your coordinate system, which defines the mathematical form of your force and uh, par part of your potential energy function, you also have to choose the location where the potential energy is zero. And with that choice, then leads to the exact mathematical representation of the potential energy function associated with your conservative force.